Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us here for our Cattle Facts Trends Plus Calcalf webinar. My name is Troy Bockelman, and uh, we'll just kind of get started here and, and go through this deck we got built for you. Um, we'll uh, get started here. So first, we'd like to thank our sponsor, Elanco. We have uh, Sarah Lenin on with us today, and she's going to finish up this uh, presentation with some information that we think is pretty good. And so uh, welcome, and uh, thank you for joining us. So like I said, my name is Troy Bockelman. I'm an analyst here at Cattlefax. I cover a little bit of the uh, international trade, some of the grain markets, a little bit of the beef, and I also cover kind of that northern corn belt, cow-calf, and fed cattle markets. And so um, thank you. We'll just kind of start and just do a little presentation overview of what we're going to do. And, and so when we think about um, this webinar, our goals is we're just going to kind of talk about cattle and feedstuff market projections. We'll talk a little bit about supply projections, both the cattle and beef industry. You know, we got, we've been in expansion phase here since 2015. We have uh, more cattle coming to us, and we'll kind of just talk, lay out that projections for 2019 for the cattle and beef industry. Then we'll switch it over to Patrick Linnell, and he'll talk a little bit about the slaughter and cull call market, and uh, you know, just some of the capacity and expectations for kind of that cow market going forward. Then uh, Sarah Lenin will talk about the cow-calf spring uh, preparation plans that she has. So we'll just start here, and this is the uh, U.S. corn stocks to use. And you can see, you know, this is going back on a monthly basis. The new crop estimates are released in May, and this is going back to May 2015. And you can see really from May 2015 into May 2018, Stocks to use were generally kind of above that, you know, 12 to 14, even up to 16 percent. And during that same time, when you're looking at, you know, the prices, you kind of have that four dollar level here. And you can see that when prices, on average, are below four dollars, we generally have stocks to use that are above 12 percent. Recently, with you know, kind of just a increased use of corn and you know, decent uh, yield at 178.9 in the December WASI that was estimated production uh, near year ago levels, but that increased demand we've seen in both ethanol and feed and residual and exports have kind of drawn on that ending stocks. And you can see lately we've been running around that 11.8% stocks to use number. As we go into kind of that first half of 2019, we expect stocks to use to continue to stay in that really 11% to 13%, you know, due to the government shutdown. We have seen a lack of data where the USDA WASDE report was not released in January. That would have given us the final yield numbers uh, and the final crop production. When we look at when that does finally come out, when we get the government we opened, we don't see any real significant changes in yield. We could see a you know a yield lower by a bushel or maybe you know half a bushel in that area, which would tighten those stocks use a little bit. But we're also seeing um, strong feed uh, residual demand. But we're seeing ethanol demand where ethanol margins are a little weaker and we've seen a little uh, pullback in ethanol production. And so kind of going forward through really, you know, the late spring, early summer time period, we really do see stocks to use kind of in that 11, 11 to 13 percent, maybe that 12, 12 and a half percent, you know, would probably be a pretty good number. But all in all, a good comfortable position when we look at stocks to use and when we look at the spot corn futures price. So just kind of you know, keeping in mind that stocks use are a little tighter than they have been recently. So we could see prices track up closer to that $4 level, maybe a little rise a little above it as we get into the spring or into the summer, as we get those weather scares that we get each year when we're thinking about the spot market. But all in all, you know, the focus will be on the, say the 2019 crop as we continue to draw the, down these um, ending stocks, you know, we'll see where, if we have trend line yield of kind of 177 and higher, we should still continue to be in a, in a comfortable position. But if we start seeing some dry weather or maybe some poor crop conditions, we could see some increased volatility in this corn market going through 2019. We look at hay prices, and when we think about hay prices, you know, when we look at a year ago, we were in a drought for much of the country. And, you know, now that drought has kind of relieved, and we'll talk about that in a little bit, we do have a little bit of drought on the West Coast, but a lot of the hay-grown region has received adequate 
and above average moisture as we think about kind of this late fall winter time period. And because of that, we do see hay production increasing in 2019, which will pressure prices down a little bit. The average last year was right around 160 when we're thinking about the all hay price. So this would be all hay, not just alfalfa or not other hay, but all hay. And we might see, you know, maybe a 10 to $12 reduction on the yearly average for all hay prices. And so we have increasing supply due to adequate weather. We don't see any real big changes in acreage, just increased production because of that um, good weather that we've had for the hay growing season as we start this year. When we think about the beef cow inventory, and we have the beef cow inventory here, and you can see that we had the low in the beef cow industry of around 2014. Since then, we've increased the inventory of around 3 million head. A lot of that increase came in 2018, but as we go through this expansion cycle, we are seeing a slowdown in the expansion rate. In 2019, or on January 1st, this would be, and so, you know, three weeks ago when the USDA report is estimating for that time period, we see the beef cow inventory up about 180,000 head, another increase in 2020 of about 100,000 head. And then kind of when we get up to that 32 million mark right around that area, you know, we really see kind of that beef cow inventory leveling off and it doesn't necessarily need to contract too much, but that 32 million head should be pretty good support as we're looking at the beef cow industry over the next, um, you know, several years. Switching gears and looking at the calf crops. We have more mama cows. And of course, if we have more mama cows, we're probably gonna have more baby cows. And so we kind of look at the calf crop. 2019, it was up about 1%. And just as the beef cow inventory, the increase is moderating, we're also seeing a decrease of an acceleration in the calf crop as well. We're expecting about 36.4 million head in 2019, which would be up about 6.6%, leveling off a little bit more in 2020 at about 36.5 million head, up about 0.3%. So while we're seeing a decrease in the expansion rate, there's still quite a few available supplies when we look at the calf crop. So we have the mama cows, we have the baby cows, and that leads us to the fed slaughter. And so when we're looking at fed slaughter, the black line would be 2019 in this area here, and this gray line, or 2018, this gray line would be 2019. When we kind of look at this chart and you look at this 480,000 head a week, that would be considered a 40 hour week for the packer when you're thinking about harvest capacity. And so because we see about a 300,000 head increase in 2019, much of that increase will have to happen in kind of this first four months of the year, just because that is where we have the available harvest capacity. Now, one thing we are seeing is we are seeing winter weather and you know strong winter weather moving through when we think about the top six cattle feeding regions. And what this could do is it could kind of push some of these cattle back. So if you're thinking about Jan cattle marketed in Jan, Maybe they move to Feb and keep moving on down the line so that these kind of level out a little bit. But when we get into the second half of 2019, much we might not see the tail off as much as it did last year. We could push, keep pushing cattle back, building that front end supply, and then leveling out more of the second half of 2018 or 2019. And so when we kind of look at the five-year average, it kind of does the same thing we did a year ago, but what, it would be a lot, looking a lot more along the lines of what we did in 2017. So while we could see prices supported here in the early part of the year, as we build that front end supply and push those cattle back, you could add more risk because we're above that 40 hour week into the second half of the year. Looking at, so we, now we have U.S. beef imports and we have exports. And so we've gone through the mama cows, the baby cows, we've gone through the harvest. We've, now we're looking at beef imports and exports. And so when you kind of look at beef imports and exports, the red line is going to be your imports and the blue line is going to be your exports. And you can see as we go through the early part of the 2000s with, you know, pretty decent 
growth as we went through that time period, about a half a billion pounds. Export markets were shut off because of B BSE. So we have seen growth continue since the markets opened up. When you're looking at 2016, 2017, and 2018, they were all above 10% growth rates. So when you're kind of looking over time and you look and you have a couple years and then you have a pullback, you have a few years of growth and then you have a pullback. And when we're kind of going forward, we see about a 6% growth rate in US beef exports in 2019. So that'd be a plus 6%. And so you kind of look at, we look at the Asian markets have been, had really strong demand. South Korea beef ex exports are up about 40%. Japan beef exports are up, you know, pretty close to that 8 to 10 percent. We're seeing stronger beef exports to Mexico, a little weaker um, from Canada. But all in all, we're see continuing to see growth in beef exports, but just at a slower rate than we've seen the last couple years. Now, beef imports, when we look at 2018, and really the last couple of years, we've seen some small decreases, but relatively steady for the last three years. Australia liquidated their cow herd uh, from 2014 to 2017. They started rebuilding, and then in 2018, drought came back into Australia. Slaughter was up about 9%. Beef production was up about 9%. And because of that, weakened prices down there. We've seen a little, you know, kind of stability in beef uh, imports. When we think about Australia in 2019, we expect beef production to be down nearly 6%. Because of that, we're going to see a little less beef imported into the U.S., and as well as strong per capita consumption in Mexico is also reducing the amount of beef that is coming north from Mexico into the U.S. So when we look at, put it all together, and we go through the whole supply side, the bottom line is when we come down to it, with that, with that 300,000 head increase in slaughter, a 6% increase in beef exports, and a 4% decrease in beef imports, per capita supplies are gonna be relatively flat in 2019. And so when we think about kind of what's going on in the global markets, you know, is there gonna be a recession globally or in the US in 2019? Or more likely, as in our estimation, is gonna be in 2020. When we think about some of the trade deals that are going on with the US, Mexico, Canada trade agreement, we did see the TPP 2.0 or the CPTPP being ratified and implemented, which then dropped the tariff rates from most of the countries that go into Japan, including Australia, which is our main competitor. You know, when we think about trade, trade is really what is going on here when we see per capita supplies being flat from really 2017 on into 2019. We do see a little bit of tick increase just through a little bit of increased beef production in the U.S. in 2020. But when we look at, think about trade, and we think about the importance of trade on the U.S. market, it really comes down to this per capita consumption. How much beef is available on the U.S. market? So as I said earlier, we have had, it's been wet. We've had, had winter, weather, or winter weather. We are in a winter weather market year. And so when we think about this as a daily precipitation accumulation for the top six weighted average cattle regions. So this would be Kansas, Nebraska, Iowa, Oklahoma, Texas, and Colorado. And you, this data is through Monday. And you can see that we are the wettest on record going back to 1984. Now what this does is, as most of you know, it gets to real cold and wet, will cause muddy or Greasy pen conditions, cattle will build up with mud, and performance will suffer because of that. So when we think about the daily Kansas fed cattle price, and so you can see that since the low in at 107 in July, the summer low, as the market has trended higher during that time period, specifically the Kansas fed cattle price, we had a low 107, and on average, we have about a 15% rally from the first or the second half low of the year to the next year's first half high. And so that would put you right around that mid-20s. 
Well, what has happened because of the, all the weather and the winter weather market year we're having, really what you can expect is about a 19% rally coming off those lows. That would put you kind of into the low 130s, the 130, maybe 132 area. And so that is part of what's going on in this market is that you know we have these muddy pen conditions, we're pushing some of this cattle back, we're decreasing that front end supply, which is then supporting this um, cash market as we walk into the spring. So we have the supply. So this is the um, feeder cattle and calf supply outside of feed yards. We're estimating on January 1st, they're up about 395,000 head. 1.5% above a year ago, right around 26.5 million head. If you take the increase of cattle on feed, of about 300,000 head, you have a total feeder, total feeder cattle and calf supply of about 700,000 head for the year. And so we do have adequate feeder supplies out there, which is starting to pressure these feeder prices. So we have muddy pen conditions. We're pushing some of these cattle back. A lot of our feed yards are at capacity. And when they're, they're, there's just not that available room to place some of these cattle. And so when we think about the cattle on feed, the cattle on feed is the largest it's been since 2012. And total, when you're talking about feed yards over 1,000 head, and total cattle on feed, so that includes the cattle on feed that are under 1,000 head, it'd be the largest since 2008. So we have plenty of supplies out there, and we have more coming as we go down the line. So what does that mean? To when we think about the cow calf producer or the backgrounder. So one of the, when we look at the simple average of the fed cattle profit and loss, assuming no risk management, you know, you can see as you kind of go through this time period here, it was really kind of a break even business. You made some money some years, you lost some money some years. But then, you know, really kind of since the early part of the 2000s, we've seen some really wide swings in the profitability of the cattle feeder. In 2018, we're estimating that the cattle feeder lost right around $55 a head. So now we continue with this story of you know wet pen conditions, and now we have big supplies and the cattle feeder is losing some money. So when we kind of look at the, let me erase my drawings here. When we're looking at the Cattle Facts Weekly 750 pound steer price, you know, we are seeing some weakness in that price in the early part of the year. On our yearly average, we expect prices to be down about $3 from a year ago, but you can also see that our range, we have a low of 130 and a high of 160. When you're looking at this green line, which would be your index of the last seasonal, 20 seasonal Fed market years, when we're, this Fed market is in a seasonal year, you would expect prices to kind of trend a little higher into the end of January, find their low here in February, and then really move higher into that fall high. Well, what we're seeing is because of the pen conditions, because of kind of that weather influence, because of pushing some of these cattle back and big supplies, we're seeing some weakness in this 750 pound steer price. Same thing kind of happened a year ago, but it was more to do, a lot to do with we had a drought in some of those areas and we had the big supplies and so different conditions, but we did see a little bit of a price increase as we went into February, a little contra seasonal when looking at the index. But when we think about just kind of this, it didn't really do a whole lot for prices as we went through the first five months of the year, relatively choppy and flat right around that, you know, kind of dollar forty five to a dollar fifty area or maybe dollar forty one to a dollar fifty depending on how you're looking at the chart so when we're thinking about the next you know four to five months on the seven fifty feeders, really it should take a lot of the personality of like a year ago. then when we work through and we get through some of this wet weather, we uh, lessen up some of this front end supply as we think about going forward. You know, when we get into kind of February, every day on average, the pens should get a little better, support some of that demand. So there's really kind of a battle between these large supplies that we have, along with um, 
you know, a weakening de demand recently. So I would expect going forward, you know, we'll probably see a, a shape kind of like a year ago. We might go down to that 130, but that's pretty low. But if they, we get down into that 135 area on the bottom side for the next, you know, several months, maybe we see that top side, you know, right around that one high 140s until we get into that summer time period and work through some of this weather. So let's talk a little bit about just what's going on with this whole drought situation. So the top map up on here would be the January 15th, 2019 drought index. And the bottom map would be your 2018 from January drought index. And you can see much in the central part of here, get into the Texas Panhandle area here, the Southern Plains, stuff like that. You can see that we were in a pretty significant drought last January that we saw that on the ability to put cattle out on wheat pasture. But then w since we've had that moisture starting in October, really through, you know, today, you can see much of that drought has alleviated. We do have a little bit of drought in kind of the Four Corners region and a little bit of the west side. But when we kind of look at the big picture on the U.S., conditions look pretty good for both, um, you know, placing feeder or calves out on wheat as well as out on pasture. And then you think about the beginning of the hay season as we get into the spring time period, you know, as well as adequate moisture as we start this 2019 crop year. So looking at the, or the 550 steer price, you can see here, you know, the same thing before the index of the last 20 seasonal fed years. We got 2018 in the blue, 2019 in the black. And we've kind of started out below year ago levels, largely due to just heavy supplies, you know, but we'll likely see this move higher into the spring time period, partly because, you know, we do have pretty good wheat out there that people are able to place some of these calves out on wheat and on pasture. That should be supportive demand. And when we kind of look into that spring high time period, you know, we could see prices up in here into the 180. One thing to note is that on average, from your fall low to your spring high, there's an average of about 19% increase during that time period. So if you're looking at that fall low, a seasonal average would suggest prices could get up into that 195. Now, because of the large supplies that we talked about earlier, that's not a percent, that's a dollar, because of the supplies that we talked about earlier, this is probably a pretty lofty target. But could we get up into that 180 or 185 for a spring high? That is very likely. We'll expect a lot of this to be seasonal like a year ago. You know, maybe we find our high a little bit later and then move lower into the fall. So I think now, oh, we'll talk about the watch list. So there's a, wanted to share a lot of slides, but with limited time, I wanted to get some information out in front of you. So I just kind of put together a little watch list for 2019. So we talk about the global. You know, you all have heard about the trade war with China. We got tariffs on U.S. soybeans and U.S. pork. We had tariffs to Mexico. We continue to have tariffs on pork to Mexico. Now we did reach that agreement, but we still are negotiating uh, we did have a meeting that was scheduled to China. Apparently that was canceled, but they're continuing to have talks with China. Until we figure out what we're going to do with this trade war with China and have a trade agreement reached, I would expect increased volatility on the U.S. pork markets and the U.S. soybean markets. You kind of watch the tweets that come out of the White House, and you see as a tweet comes out, you might see soybeans move higher if there's a positive tweet about this trade war. There's a negative tweet like the other day where he said he canceled the meeting. Well, you might see soybeans move lower. This would be one of my watch items. Another thing we have is we have African swine fever in China. You know, China has half the world's hogs and there's no vaccine for this disease. So pork is a main staple in the Chinese market. They have half the world's hogs. And so when you think about this African swine fever, they've likely liquidated about a million hogs so far. And the question is, are these feeder hogs or are these sows? Because if they're sows and they would liquidate a million, that would be about a 
7 million feeder pigs. So just keeping track of this, there's, you know, 60 or 70 cases. It's spread all the way through China. And so just keep track of this. We don't any ex expect any market impacts on U.S. pork in, in the first half of 2019. But as we get into late 2019, I would be looking at seeing what is going on at, at, with the ASF in China, how many hogs they've liquidated or reporting to liquidate. A lot of underreporting is um, understood to be happening, but uh, that would be my watch item. The US, Mexico, and Canada trade agreement. You know, we did come up with an agreement, but Congress, as we know, the government is shut down now, and Congress has not ratified this agreement. And so I'd be looking at when we ratify this agreement, the steel and aluminum tariffs come off, then do we see the Mexico relieve those 20% tariffs on US pork? The CPTPP, which would be the TPP that, that the US pulled out of, is now implemented. And the US is having bilateral trade talks with Japan. It'll be important that we continue to push for bilateral talks with Japan. And Japan has said that they would give us when it comes to meat, the same deal that's in CPTPP. This would put us at a, a level playing field with Australia. Currently, Australia has an about 11.5% tariff advantage of all of the beef that goes into Japan, and about 90% of Japan's beef imports come from both the US and Australia. I'd be watching for a slowdown in global economic growth. This could affect export potential. I showed you the slide earlier about per capita supplies and per capita supplies uh, steady with a year ago. If we see a global slowdown and exports start to slow, we could see more beef back onto the domestic market, which could then pressure prices. When we think about the domestic markets, <clears throat> I would be looking at the weather market impacts. I'd be watching for an uncurrent front end supply and I'm watching pen conditions because this will have a direct relationship with your feeder cattle supply. Another thing would be your fed cattle, cattle slaughter capacity. You know, we have labor issues and we have hook space issues. Uh, when we showed the short er, chart earlier of the 480 head a week kill week, that would be considered a 40 hour week. Well, all but one month, we're forecast to be above that 40 hour week. Just another record in total meat production. Beef and pork and poultry production continues to grow, and so we'll have a new record in total production here in the U.S. That could pressure the U.S. domestic prices as well. And then just the tighter corn supplies and the 2019 corn crop potential. And then now I will pass this over to Patrick Linnell. Hello. <clears throat> Thanks, Troy. So I'm going to lead this discussion today, uh, taking a little bit more in-depth look at the coal cow market and the trends that we see there and our expectations here going forward. So just starting again, looking at the total cow inventory um, in the U.S. And now this is a little different than the one that Troy showed. Uh, this is the beef cows plus dairy. Um, but if you, as you look at it, we're seeing basically the same trends here. Uh, we see where the, the inventory made a low in 2014, and since then we've expanded, um, as Troy said. Um, and looking at the total cow inventories, uh, we expect that we'll stabilize in between this 41 to 42 million head range, which is comparable with you know, back in the mid to late uh, 2000s. And so as we start digging into that deeper, uh, you know, as we look at the beef cow side of things, you know, the, as the beef cow herd expansion has, came, has continued and come closer to completion you know, as operations and 
producers come closer to carrying capacity for their operations um, or just what they consider to be more the ideal size where they want to hold their operation. And um, we've seen increased culling as those marginal cows that maybe we kept back as we were really looking to aggressively expand the operations. And uh, now those cows are going to market and, uh, and being culled. And so we expect to see that to continue as the beef cow herd expansion comes to a flattening point in the expansion cycle. And now looking to the dairy side, so what this graph shows is the USDA milk income over feed costs. And it's a ratio or a calculation that we like to look at um, as a good indicator of dairy profitability and profitability in that segment. And so as you look at this and look to the right-hand side of the graph, there since about um, the beginning of 2018, yeah, that that uh, proxy for dairy herd profitability has been severely depressed, um, and and also for quite a long period of time. And as that's happened, we've seen also seen an uptick in the dairy cow slaughter. So we're seeing a few more of those showing up in the slaughter mix. And again, that's something that we expect to see to uh, continue for for as long as milk prices stay depressed um, or uh, if there was a significant increase on the feed cost or other cost side of things for the dairy operator as well. So as we start to look uh, to the slaughter side of things, I think this map is a good place to start. Uh, it, so what these dots are, are, this shows most of the major cow and bull slaughter plants in the United States. And these dots account for approximately 85% of cow slaughter. Now, since 2014, when the US cow herd uh, hit its low point in the cattle cycle, as far as inventory numbers go, we've seen a handful of plants close throughout Wisconsin, Minnesota, uh, Texas, Mississippi, and down in Florida as well. And so as that's happened, we've seen a decrease in our slaughter capacity on the non-fed side of the industry as well, uh, similar to what Troy showed um, on the fed cattle side. Uh, now we have seen a little bit of packing capacity added back um, with a plant coming online in Idaho and talks of other plants adding second shifts or uh, increasing their capacity in that way. But it, but another thing that we see from this map um, is, as you look to the area surrounding surrounding Missouri, um, to southeast Kansas, Oklahoma, um, Arkansas, um, as well as you know western Tennessee, Kentucky, Illinois, that region, you see that that's particularly devoid of slaughter capacity, but. That's also a region where a lot of the beef cow herd resides. So while it's uh, while that region's flanked by slaughter uh, capacity and available packing plants, uh, it's still uh, relatively devoid compared to how many plant how many cattle live in that area. And the other area is this eastern Montana into the Dakotas, um, you know, down into the sand hills of Nebraska. Um, in Wyoming as well. Uh, also quite a few cows up in that area and um, again, devoid of packing capacity. So as we start thinking about um, where those cows have to go to uh, be slaughtered, it becomes a freight away, uh, start to see some freight away discounts and where that begins to drag on cow values uh, in these areas that are devoid of packing capacity relative to inventories. So as we talk about a larger U.S. beef cow herd and increased beef cow culling from those, um, coupled with a, a bit of an increase on the dairy cow slaughter side, it's no surprise that we've seen a significant increase in non-fed slaughter in 2018 um, compared to 17. And as, as uh, those trends continue, where we have, again, a slow expansion in the beef cow herd, more culling, um, depressed dairy margins, uh, we forecast that 
non-fed slaughter uh, looking to the gray dotted line will be higher again here in 2019. And th the other thing to important note from this graph is the red bar at 130. So similar to what Troy was discussing on the non-fed side, that's where we estimate our uh, the US non-fed packing capacity to be at. So as we, for basis of 40 hour kill week. So as, and as you compare the black line where we were in 18 relative to that, the beef cow or the cow and bull slaughter was challenging or exceeding that level throughout most of the year. And so, and the way that the plants get around that is really stressing and straining their capacity as well as operating on Saturdays, which as we, um, you know, think about how tight the labor market is in the U.S. Um, currently, you know, that, that's certainly a challenge. And so as a result, we've seen um, where this favors the bargaining position or the leverage position uh, of, the cow, of the cow and bull packer, where uh, they, they can exert some uh, influence there and, um, you know, they need some margin, I guess, to, uh, to incentivize these large kill levels and to run at greater than a 40 hour kill week and stress those plants. And as we go and look at, look at the beef side of things, yeah, the, the effect of this uh, increase in slaughter is also having an effect coming through on the beef, uh, on beef prices as well, um, basis the 90% lean beef trimmings. Um, so as non-fed production has returned to levels that we saw in the late 2000s or earlier in this decade, we've seen some pressure on the 90s price relative to the highs in 14 and 15. And another, another uh, major factor here is abundant and cheap competing protein, that these 90% trimmings are what's competing and most, uh, the most close substitute for uh, poultry and pork. And so those will also continue to uh, be trends that challenge uh, the 90% demand and price here going forward. So another, so what this graph shows is compares the cow and bull slaughter um, on an annual basis to U.S. beef imports. And, you know, clearly while there's a, there's some error around it and it's not a perfect relationship, but I think there's an obvious trend here between these two factors. And so as we tend to see the cow and bull slaughter increase and we produce more, uh, more non-fed beef here in the US, but we tend to see uh, beef imports react to that and come down as well. So as we look to 2018, relative to 2017, and um, we see that it's obviously fairly rel or elevated relative to the trend. And what that's mainly an effect of is, you know, while we did see increased cow and bull slaughter in 2018, um, our friends down under in Australia saw an increase in slaughter as uh, their, their industry's been trying to expand um, their beef cow herd and inventory but in 17 and 18, they came through severe drought, which we saw um, drought forced liquidation, increased slaughter, and their lean prices came down. And even though our 90s prices um, came down, it, it was still um, an impact. Uh, and, and we saw more, more imports uh, from that side of things. But as we look forward to 2019, we expect to see uh, U.S. beef imports come down as the uh, conditions have improved in Australia. And from that end, um, they've de expected to decrease their slaughter and they'll have an increase in their lean beef price, um, as well as simply the fact that we're going to be producing more, uh, more non-fed beef here as well. And the 90s uh, will come into under pressure here and it'll be a less favorable import market. So as we take as we take looking at 90s and the beef production and drill that down to utility cow values, 
Yeah, really there's two things that we see at work here influencing the utility cow prices. Yeah, 90s have came down as we've talked about with increased production and competition from pork and poultry. But in addition to that, the as you look to the purple line, that's the percentage uh, of value that the utility cow represents from the 90s, from the 90s lean. So how much um, how much value it's returning of that product. And, but as we've seen slaughter capacity decrease and the cow herd numbers increase, we've seen a sharp downtrend in that ratio. So as we've exceeded our slaughter capacity, um, yeah, that, this shows how we've needed to transfer that margin um, to incentivize these, uh, these slaughter levels uh, for the non-fed uh, cow and bull. As you move looking to this on a seasonal basis, so yeah, and I think uh, most many people listening in on this call this evening, uh, yeah, it's well known that um, that there's a distinct seasonality to the utility cow market, where the market tends to make a price low in the fourth quarter as cows as calves are weaned and cows are sent to market, and then it rallies into the spring as as that glut of coal cows is uh, it's cleaned up per se from the market and and, and beef demand uh, especially for lean grinds improves into the spring and summer and but as we start looking closer looking to uh, these individual years that we have plotted here you know in 17 and into 18 we've seen a decrease in that spring rally from the fall low into the spring high and again that's just an effect of if we think back to the the slaughter graph over the year, we begin to also challenge that slaughter capacity um, through the first half of the year, um, which we haven't tended to seasonally do. And so what that does is it dampens the effect of that spring rally. And as we look forward to um, setting expectations for 2019 and beyond, yeah, we at Cattle Facts certainly expect that we'll still see that same seasonality to the market for the most part, but it may it may be a depressed or a, a smaller seasonal increase um, just due due to those packing constraints. And as you can see on this slide, uh, we have the annual price forecast there uh, for 2019, um, just to give some ballpark estimates um, basis of U.S. average utility cow price. So as we start, as we start thinking about, yeah, that this message and that um, the trends as far as the coal cow market goes, and try to think about you know, what does this mean and what can we do about these trends um, and expectations that we have, and I know many people have already you know made the decision on what they, what you've done with your cows for this season, but as we look forward, you know, what can we do, and. I think as we think about the seasonality of this market um, and how reliable it tends to be, I think this is one where flexibility certainly could pay some dividends. As we look you know, back across history, we tend to see that eight out of 10 years perform um, the same seasonal pattern and or what we would call seasonal years. And using the seasonality um, for 80% of the time, um, you know, that's the, easiest form of risk management that um, we could count on. So, so what can we do using those seasonalities? Well, at, at uh, risk of proposing something uh, absurd, you know, maybe we should consider, and for many people this may not work, but I think it's worth considering if we could shift a portion of, these, of the cow herd to a fall calving program. Um, or if you're looking to expand, maybe that's um, expand into that area. Um, you know, certainly feeding cows or feeding pears through the winter uh, in a lot of regions of the country, Mother Nature will be harder, but but Mother Market will tend to be nicer as well, as instead of selling uh, cows and calves into that uh, fall run where the market uh, is overrun by cows and calves, instead 
you know, selling into the April, May, June timeframe uh, for cows and calves, where they're both a high demand and tight supply for those cattle. Uh, another potential option is considering early weaning, uh, you know, taking the cows off early and sending the cows down the road before we get to that fourth quarter low. Uh, again, uh, just uh, potential options to consider. Um, and as, lastly, retaining ownership. So instead of you know, the changing your program doesn't work, yeah, maybe we should consider uh, retaining those cows from the fall run uh, into, into the beginning of the next calendar year. Uh, over time, what we've seen is going back to 1980, this has been one of the most reliable returns um, with 24 of the last 30 years posing an advantage by doing this. Uh, but but at, the, at the same time, I think is we need to think about the caveats of this market that we're currently in. Um, I think this would be one that would take some careful consideration as we consider that um, these dampened uh, rallies from the fall low into the spring high, as well as um, at these lower coal cow values, um, looking carefully comparing our cost of gains or our cost to hold those cows over from the fall into the um, into the next calendar year, uh, and it, it it would be something that certainly may offer opportunities for some, but um, but would need to be something that would be closely examined. And so, with that, I thank you all for your time, and I'd like to pass this over to Dr. Sarah Lanine with the Landco. Thank you, Patrick. On behalf of Elanco, thank you for giving me a few minutes of your time and for welcoming Elanco Animal Health into this series. On the next slide, I want to talk to you a little bit about some general priorities and considerations for cow-calf production, specifically in the spring. So these fall into categories of nutrition, health, and production. Obviously, in 10 minutes, I can't discuss each of those thoroughly, so I'm going to focus on protein and energy balance within nutrition, and then I'm going to follow that up with a discussion about the value of implanting because it's really the time of year to be thinking about getting implants into your calves. Don't let me forget about body condition score. Um, I want to discuss that for a brief minute because it is so critical to predicting and giving us a quantitative look at, bow, at cow nutritional status. And so the body condition score that cow is going to calve in is highly indicative of her future reproductive success. So for spring calving beef cows, that body condition score is often set already. You can't really do much to change it because you are currently in calving season or you're quickly approaching that. But it's something you can consider making sure you have her in that right body condition score for future spring calving and also for fall calving cows. It's also important from a nutritional perspective to avoid toxicities during this time of year, specifically grass tetany. If you're providing loose mineral supplementation or Johnson grass toxicity, depending on temperature fluctuations, and we've seen a lot of those this winter. Of course, it's really important from a health perspective to prepare calves for a lifetime of immune success, and we feel like that really starts with proper vaccinations. At Elanco, we firmly believe in vaccinating with a modified live vaccine at weaning. Um, such as a titanium, which is a five-way, including BRD and five strains of lepto. If in your herd you are facing challenges with pneumonia, we highly encourage you to speak to your veterinarian about the newest vaccine on the market, which is Nuplura PH. It's a really unique vaccine because it uses a recombinant technology that has a purified antigen. That's a really fancy way of saying there's less cell debris in the vaccine, so it's very smooth. It has about 97% less endotoxin than competitor vaccines such as Presponse SQ, and it's got a rapid onset of immunity of about 10 days. 
If pneumonia is something that you are challenged with, you're fighting, we definitely encourage you to speak to a health practitioner about Nupleura pH or find any Lanco sales representative to speak to. Now to move to the next slide and focus a little bit more on cow nutrient imbalance. When we talk about cow nutrient imbalance, we often talk about, am I supplying enough protein and energy to that cow? When we discuss energy, we discuss it in terms of TDN for forage fed animals. So that's total digestible nutrients, which is on the graph on the left. This is looking at the requirement of energy or TDN over months since calving. So on the x-axis, that's going to be her months since calving. So at one to two months, she's going to be in peak lactation. She's going to have the highest energy requirement. That's going to decline to weaning and then come back up as she goes through gestation again. Now, if we were to pull in a protein requirement graph, it would look very similar to this, just different values on the y-axis. What the key is here is to match your nutritional resources to the natural cycle of requirements that she goes through as she changes physiological state throughout the year. And I think it's really important to consider this in spring nutrition. Often, as we look at the graph on the right, we know that we're shifting from supplementing cows and feeding stored forages to green up. And the stage of maturity is an indication of nutrient value. So in really early maturing forages, we know that they have a high nutritive value. That's no secret. The key is to know what they're high in. So if that forage is really high in protein and really high in moisture, it might be low in energy. It might be so high in moisture, it does not allow her to consume enough to meet her energy requirement. And this creates a nutritive gap as you shift from the supplementation program or grazing dormant grasses from the winter into grazing that really lush forage. And so I would like you to consider avoiding that nutrient gap and just really understanding what your forages have to offer. So being able to sample them, knowing if they're meeting her energy requirements specifically, and then also checking to meet, make sure they meet the protein requirement. One of the tools that we like to use in Elanco is Ionophores. Remincent is the only approved Ionophore for beef cows. It is a great tool that offers energetic efficiency advantages for beef cows, especially during the winter when feed costs are really expensive, and it can offer some advantages during these nutritive gap times. Remincent has some benefits, not only in terms of improving feed efficiency, cows can usually eat five to 10% less and still maintain body condition, but they also have that coccidiosis protection when remincent is being fed. So let's switch gears here on the next slide and talk a little bit about the value of implanting. And that's what I'll wrap up with today. This table shows the value of implanting over a lifetime of an animal, the potential lifetime, depending on what route they go through the segments. This is done externally to Elanco, so this is looking at a lot of different averages of cattle lots, and they outlined it by specific phases of production. So for suckling steer calves, for implants that are given about two to three months old, there's an increase in live weight of about 18 pounds. This was a 5% improvement in average daily gain that we value at about $16. If you retain ownership, the advantage for implanting stalker calves is 33 pounds. For feed yard animals, it's gonna be an extra 75 pounds. For all phases of production, implanting adds about an extra 130 pounds. So the return on investment of implanting is very good and it's also a very consistent technology. At Elanco, we hear a lot of feedback on why specifically cow-calf producers don't always choose to implant. And the two things we hear pretty commonly is that there is a fear that they will not earn as much at the sale barn if they sell implanted calves versus non-implanted calves. And we've looked at years of superior livestock data on sale barn animals, and we found that simply implants do not reduce the price of, sale of calves at the sale barn. So really that is a myth. We also hear a lot of feedback about the hormone content and concerns of hormones showing up in the meat. And we know from a lot of research, specifically at universities, that if you look at the hormone content for a steak that came from an implanted animal versus not, it's about 0.7 nanograms higher in hormone. 
when they are implanted versus not. Now to give you a reference point, one nanogram is about the size of a blade of grass, a single blade, so it's a pretty minute amount. And keep in mind there's also hormone in everyday other foods that you may consume, such as 450 nanograms in potatoes or a great deal of nanograms in soy products that are used to make coffee drinks commonly sold throughout the country. So we definitely respect the concern for hormones, but it's a rather minute difference between implanted animals and non-implanted animals when it comes to meat consumption. So on the next slide, we'll take a look at um, one of Elanco's implants, which is component EC with Tylen. This is Elanco's implant that is approved for suckling calves. The implant that it's excuse me, that is approved for grazing animals can be component TEG with Tylen. The component line of implants are the only implants that do have Tylen in with the implant pellet, and this is to help alleviate any sort of abscesses that may develop at the implant site. Component EC with Tylen was used in a study done at Oklahoma State University to look at the value of implanting calves suckling calves versus not, and they found that by implanting suckling calves, you'll gain about 0.11 extra pounds per day compared to not using this technology. Now, to put this in economics terms, component EC with Thailand costs about $1.20. As we saw on the previous slide, it's going to add about 18 extra pounds to suckling calves and bring an added value of about $16, which will likely pay for the entire vaccination program of your cows and it'll probably compensate for the labor of vaccinating those as well. So the value of implanting calves, especially with a component line, we feel is, is very valuable to cow-calf producer. At Elanco, our goal is really for you to have access to as many tools as possible and to maximize health and production of the herd. We're really excited about our different products, whether it's component implants, Remincin as Nionophore, or new advanced technologies and vaccines such as Nuplura, but really we're more excited about helping the producers and being able to offer different tools that we think are really going to add value to your production herd. So if you have any questions, I um, encourage you to contact an Atlanta sales rep, your veterinarian, or someone else that may put you in contact with us and we'd be happy to discuss these with you. So with that, I thank you for giving me some of your time this evening and back over to you, Patrick and Troy. Well, thank you, Sarah. And we really appreciate your time and Atlanta's sponsorship of this, of this webinar. So just a few concluding remarks. Um, we'd like to make you all aware of um, some Cattle Facts upcoming events. Um, we're just, have just rolled out our 2018 cow-calf survey, which you can take on our website by going to cattlefacts.com to the About tab, and then 2018 cow-calf survey. Um, and we're, we have a, a drawing on there for uh, the winner, and uh, I think this really provides some valuable information to people that take it, and we do supply the results of that back to everyone who takes it. Um, just as far as benchmarking purposes go and understanding trends um, relative to the cow-calf industry. Our next Trends Plus cow-calf webinar will be May 22nd, and we will also be holding a risk management seminar here in Denver on June 19th through 20th, and we are, uh, would be happy to see you there. With that, if you have any questions, um, please email those to Troy or myself, and we will get back to you with those answers as quickly as we can. And also, you can access an archive of this webinar video for 30 days on our website. And so we definitely welcome you to do that um, if you'd like to review it. So with that, I want to thank you all again for taking your time to be with us. And you all have a good evening. Thank you.